One of my absolute favorite childhood movies was Arthur in the Invisibles. You may laugh. I'm giving you permission. <laughs> If I had written a review for it sometime around 2006 when it came out, I would have said something like, this movie is really cool. I liked it. By the way, I'm six years old. Or something like that. I even had the Arthur in the Invisibles Game Boy Advance game. I, I beat that sucker like five times. Wow. Uh, unfortunately, even if I had taken my pudgy little six-year-old hands and made a hundred alt accounts to give that movie five out of five star reviews on every site I possibly could, I probably could not have saved it from the very lukewarm oh. reception that it got. Critics and audiences alike were pretty put off by the animation which is admittedly pretty subpar, even for the time. The movie's only saving grace is that it had an inexplicably, ridiculously stacked cast. Now, what do you do when you make a movie and it barely manages to scrape a profit and the overall reception is... Meh. You milk it. What was that? You milk it. That's right, famously anti-Semitic founder of the Walt Disney Company. You milk it. You milk it for every last drop. I created a multi-billion dollar empire. All right, buddy, get your head out of your ass and put it back in the freezer. But what happens when you keep a franchise whose first debut flopped on life support for two more sequels, even though all of the big stars like Robert De Niro, David Bowie, and Jimmy Fallon all abandoned it? Well, that's when crawling out of the sewers, clutching a few gems of brilliance and artistry, but ultimately bloated with low budgets, bad acting, half-assed writing, and of course, the unapologetic fetishization of female trauma, the horror genre takes the reins. Yep, that that's right, Arthur Malediction, actually this is French so maybe it's Arthur Malediction, is a French psychological horror film and is the official fourth installment of the children's film series. Now we've seen childhood films and movies rebranded as horror for adults many times. It's a highly successful repackaging that enjoys virality on the internet and also sometimes fills theater seats. Though whether or not people get up from those theater seats wondering if they just wasted $10 is a, another story. What makes Arthur Malediction unique is that it was produced and written by Luc Besson, the same Luc Besson who wrote and directed the Arthur trilogy and wrote the original children's books the films were based on. So the question is, what the actual f*** was Luc Besson taking when he signed off on this movie? Because ding dong diddy kong, I need to get my hands on that prescription. Like the biblical Abraham, Luc Besson led his bright-eyed brainchild to be slaughtered on the altar of a quick cash grab attempt, with the movie getting a staggeringly low 3.3 out of 10 on IMDb and 1.1 out of 5 on Letterboxd. Who thought that making a horror movie about a dude obsessed with Arthur and the Invisibles was a good idea? That is a great... Great question. I don't think a single person was thinking throughout the entire process this movie was made. Um, what the f- Can someone explain me what the f- Oh look, this person actually rated this uh, 7 out of 10 stars. Oh, 2 stars if I was sober. In France, where the film was released, it not only got an incredibly low average score of 1.8 out of 5, but there were hardly any press titles that even bothered to review it at all. So yeah, a weird French director with an impressive portfolio and a dubious past decided to make a bizarre and unnecessary horror spin-off to his own mediocre children's movie franchise, and that should be the end of the video. But it's not because I have no self-respect. I paid eight crisp American dollars to rent a movie so terrible that even the French hated it, and I watched it. So you don't have to. You're welcome. So the first thing I have to say about this film is it has one of the most god-awful English dubs that I have ever ever suffered through. Hi there, cutie! Ah, you're so pretty. <laughs> the movie opens with the eight-year-old protagonist Alex and his friends watching the Arthur trilogy for his birthday, and when the mom tucks Alex in for the night, he tells her his dream is to become a Minamoy, the little tiny people from the movies. I, I would have bullied the f*** out of this kid, and, and I did musical theater. <laughs> Honestly, 
the opening of the film is already super weird. It, it just feels like Luc Besson is hyping himself up about how amazing his movies are and, and inventing these imaginary children that are obsessed with them. It's, it's very strange. We then cut to 10 years later where Alex escapes the French police dressed as Arthur from the movie and celebrates his 18th birthday. At this point in the story, you kind of just have to suspend disbelief that this teenager obsessed with a weird CGI cartoon from 2006 to the point that he dresses up as the main character would still have friends. But his friends are actually totally into it and one of the girls, Samantha, actually dresses up as the love interest character from the movie for the birthday party. Cue some of the most uncomfortable dialogue that I have ever witnessed in a film. That was six months ago. It's, so what? Uh, oh, my boobs got bigger. No, 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 it, that's uh -huh. not it. It's everything, the, the makeup, uh -huh. uh, yeah, right. the costume, you know, and uh, <laughs> yeah, your boobs are bigger too. <laughs> Everything in this house is themed around the Arthur movies. Posters on the wall, a collection of toys, and Alex's serial killer looking bedroom, and also many of the gifts he receives from his friends. It's just really, really weird. Later during the party, after they rewatch the trilogy and eat, what the f is that? Is that dog food? I is that dog food pizza? What the hell? Alex's friends tell him that they found the house that was used for the live action film sequences for, guess what, his favorite movies. To prove it, they show a video of two of their friends, Momo and Palu, at the house. Alex gets way too excited and they all decide to go meet the two and see the house for themselves the next day. A group of young people go on a road trip to visit an old house and strange things start happening? Somebody call the newspapers, cause that's gotta be the most creative and unique thing I've ever heard of. During the several hour drive on the way to this super cool and definitely interesting house, the teenagers stop in a small town for some food while being stared down by some friendly locals. While there, one of the girls, Matilda, is taking pictures and spots human feet just hanging from the clothesline like Hannibal Lecter was doing his laundry, but then it gets torn down by an absurd number of dogs that apparently this dude owns. Like, I love dogs too, man, but what is this, 101 Irish wolfhounds? He licks his crusty teeth a lot and tells them the house they are looking for is dangerous and fires his piece off into the air, sending them running back to the car. But shotguns and severed limbs are nothing when you're on a road trip to see the house where less than half of a shitty European cartoon was filmed at. So these cool teens keep on driving until... <gasps> Who could have predicted this? There's a tree fallen over the road! What a unique and previously unexplored plot device! So they all clamber out of the car into the dangerous woods on foot! Hooray! Excellent risk assessment, everyone! They finally make it to the house and find that all of the props and makeup from the set are still there for some reason? Which is like, Basan. Buddy, Buddy, you made the original films. Are you telling me that you just cut the cameras and left all of your shit in a random house in Normandy? Like, the, the setup doesn't work because you made the actual original goddamn movie! So anyways, after the teenagers run around exploring the house and referencing weirdly specific parts of the Arthur films... That's Balthazar's cupboard. Right, the curse. He ate his <laughs> cake in there. It was in the second one. Yeah, look at yeah. that. Four of them stumble upon a hatch leading down into the basement where they find a door locked from the inside. After a while, the only person in the group with even a toddler's level of observation skills mentions that it's strange that Momo and Palu haven't shown up yet. So they take about five minutes to yell their names and then inexplicably set up camp for the night instead of just... I don't know, staying in the house? During the night, Blondie here accidentally gives a random cell phone left in the grass a golden shower, which turns out to be their friend Momo's, but no one, no one is really worried about this uh, at, at all. After things get steamy between Alex and Sam, wi within literally two feet of all of their friends, hey, maybe that's just a French thing, Alex has a really trippy dream edited together in what I can only assume was Windows Movie Maker, and he wakes up to see figures walking in the woods with torches who vanish the moment he calls out to them. What does he do? 
He goes right the f back to bed. He really just said, not my problem. I mean, you gotta hand it to the man. He really values his sleep. Then we have a tickle fight montage in the morning set to what I hope to God is public domain music because charging to use it should classify as a federal crime. Tell me or I'll tickle it out of you. Then the gang finds out that somebody snuck into their camp and ransacked their food supply. So they send this poor idiot Douglas by himself to go buy more while Dominique and Maxime go to find water in a nearby ravine to wash off. The rest of the group then find the guard gnome that was used in the original films to mark the passage of the Minimoy world, except, oh my god, it literally looks like a Dollar Tree version of the actual gnome. Basan, it was your own goddamn movies. How are you possibly in this up? And it turns out the gnome is actually guarding a real passage into the ground, just like in the movies. Meanwhile, the whimpering nerd finds a human morphed into a tree. They never explain this. I, I watched the whole movie. This is never once explained. Then inexplicably takes his glasses off as he hears a stranger approach and gets knocked out. Ooh. Then these two blondes finally realize that their friend Momo has been hanging above them the whole time they've been in the river. How the hell did they not see him sooner? Da -binky. Da -binky. Then this Einstein proceeds to go untie the rope holding Momo steps directly into a bear trap and immediately drops Momo, snapping his neck instantly. But neither of them give a single molecular f about Momo. They, they break the trap and then they just scamper away even though they technically just murdered him. We're just blonde boys. Meanwhile, the rest of the group decide to perform a colonoscopy on the mystery hole. 60 feet down, a hand grabs the camera and starts to pull Gene into the depths. This incident finally convinces these goobers to leave, and that's when Dumb and Dumber show up covered in blood. For some reason, Sam has medication with her that is, quote, strong enough to knock out a horse. Give you enough to knock out a horse. Which I feel like is not typically just available over the counter at your local CVS, so, so either Sam is a pharmacist or she's banging the local plug. They give the medicine to Maxime and he's carried to the car by the boys while the girls wait for Douglas to come back with the other car. When the boys reach the cars, they find a tree has been cut down and smashed into the vehicle that they have the keys for. And even though looking at it, it's pretty obvious that they could have easily moved the tree off and driven the car anyways, they decide to panic instead and look for Douglas who has the other set of keys. But not before Basan sneaks in this little gem. <laughs> John, John, don't, don't you know how to get into cars and jumpstart them like they do in the movies? Why? Because I'm black? Okay. So the Da Vinci twins stay in the vehicle while Alex and Jean go searching for good old Doug. Back at the house, Matilda sees a figure watching from a window and locks herself in the barn to hide where she is stung to death by bees, which she is apparently deathly allergic to. Meanwhile, Alex and Jean find Doug's severed arms in the forest and Thing 1 and 2 get attacked in the vehicle. Alex and Jean literally hear their anguish screaming and, and they promise to come back for them if anything went wrong, but, but they decide they're just gonna get the girls instead. Looks like chivalry isn't dead. Good job, fellas. But oh no, they're too late. Some computer science major looking dude cuts the swing Sam is sitting on and the porch that they've been walking on all day without any trouble suddenly crumbles like one ply toilet paper underneath her and she falls into a hole leading to the cellar. In a weird cult room in the cellar that looks like it was put together with props from Party City, Alex finds Palou's body, but who cares? Cause Sam's alive, right? Seriously, what did Momo and Palu do to make this friend group hate them so much? Nobody reacts to their deaths at all. Did they do like an offensive impression at a party or something? As they try to escape the cellar, some dude who must have been trained by PETA from the Hunger Games literally morphs out of the wall and grabs Renata and then Alex gets decked in the face with the same right hook that got Douglas. The group wakes up tied up and surrounded by people dressed as the Bogo Metasoli, a fictional African tribe featured in the original films. We're just not gonna get into the somewhat problematic nature of the representation of African tribal culture in these films. We're just, we're just not gonna do that today. <laughs>
Even though the moon isn't full, the kidnappers want to perform the weird ritual in the films anyways, and they drag Alex away. The kidnappers apparently didn't get their not tying merit badges because the rest of the group easily untie themselves. And then Gene randomly reveals he's been strapped the whole time? Why? Are we only just now hearing about the gun, G? The kidnappers start tightening Alex's rope, which seems to be doing something for Alex. Uh. Then Jean just starts going crazy with the fakest looking prop gun I've ever seen. <laughs> Anyway, I started blasting. Then out of the forest, a bunch of dudes dressed like the dorky-looking henchmen from the Arthur movies run out and give Renata a budget abortion, then start fighting the guys dressed as the Metasoli. As Sam tries to get away, she is attacked by this guy, dressed as the main villain, Malthazar. Which, I'm sorry, he's not winning any prizes at Comic-Con for that costume, but damn, he should enter the Olympics. Look at that jump. Excellent form. Anyways, he gets thrown Looney Tunes style like 10 feet after getting shot by, oh my god, remember crusty teeth from the beginning? He's here to save the day! He kills the remaining cosplayers and then basically tells Alex, I told you so, idiot, why the hell did you come here? Which, like, that's valid. The police roll in just in time to look around and say, yep, everyone's dead. Oh, and by the way, that girl in your group that all of you ignored and bullied, uh, she's also dead. Wait, there was another girl with us? Like, seriously, no one ever notices that she's gone until the very end. This is the worst friend group ever. Then the police tell them that the people that attacked them were just random teenagers from the local town that like to do hardcore role plays, drugs, and kill each other. Ah yes, Luc Besson, you are so in touch with the youth. I remember being bored in high school and thinking to myself, you know what would be really fun? Dressing up like characters from a shitty movie released in 2006 that nobody cares about and stabbing my friends. You really got me there, buddy. So yeah, the movie ends with Alex seeing a figure peeking out of the second story and just not telling the cops about it, so I guess they can get jumped the moment they try to investigate the house. A cab, I guess. The last scene is the three surviving teens being driven away in the police van, and one final shot of the house that started it all. So yeah, that's an hour and 27 minutes of my life that I will never get back. I could have used that time to call my aging grandmother, or volunteer at a soup kitchen, or even engage in debate with someone on Twitter with an anime profile picture, but no, I chose to watch this movie instead. So yeah, the negative reviews are, um, definitely deserved. Everything from the acting to the writing to the editing, it, it literally made me feel like I was watching a high school film project. And I guess the one thing we can get out of all of this is that, um, Luc Besson should be in prison. Oh, no, not, not for making one of the most terrible movies I've ever seen. Uh, because he married a 15-year-old when he was in his 30s! <laughs>